Welcome back for one short uh, segment to finish up lecture 36 here. Uh, what I want to actually talk about is the limit of triangles in hyperbolic and elliptic geometry and specifically how this relates to the angle measure of those triangles. We know that in Euclidean geometry, every triangle has an angle sum that adds up to be 180 degrees. And so it really does, since this, this angle sum is constant, it doesn't matter how we distort the triangles, um, we're always gonna get this 180 degrees. So as we start like pushing uh, vertices together or pulling them apart, that is we're taking uh, the extreme of what could happen with a triangle, uh, this, this angle sum never really changes whatsoever. So let's think about this in the hyperbolic realm just for a second. What happens in hyperbolic geometry as we distort our triangles? Well, so let's think of this maybe with the disk model at hand, and we have some hyperbolic triangle like so, A, B, and C, like so. Well, what we know about what we know about the angle sum of this triangle, the sum of A, B, C, um, since it's hyperbolic, it'll be strictly less than 180 degrees, but it'll be greater than zero degrees. Can these limits actually be obtained? Um, we say we're less than 180 and greater than zero. Can how, how close can we get to these things? And we can get arbitrarily close. And I kind of want to illustrate how this would occur. So to obtain the 180 figure right here, because uh, the idea is the smaller, so to speak, the triangle is, the closer it'll be to a Euclidean triangle. That is, the difference between them will be harder to tell. So the smaller the hyperbolic triangle is, the closer it'll be to 180 degrees. And so what one can accomplish is if you start to let this, you, you keep angle vertices A and B fixed, so don't move them. But if you were to continuously deform this triangle, sliding angle C closer and closer and closer to the line AB, what's going to happen to angle C right here? Um, well, angle C would continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Angles A and B would continue to get smaller, smaller, and smaller until that limit is obtained, where essentially you're just going to get a line segment A, B, with C sitting between it. Um, in that situation, the measure of angle A would actually be the same as the measure of angle B, and those would both become zero-degree angles. But on the other hand, your angle C... Um, it's basically turned into two flat angles. You have angle uh, ACA and angle BC. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's a little, it's kind of weird what's happening here, but essentially angle C has become a 180 degree uh, because it's became a flat angle in that situation. Again, it, it's kind of weird describing this thing, but that's the idea is we're taking the limit um, as the thing converges to each other. And then, of course, as you continue to push these points towards each other, uh, this thing will eventually uh, squish into just to a single point, right? That's another way of thinking of continuously shrinking your hyperbolic triangle. So this 180 degree measure can be obtained uh, when your triangle degenerates into a segment or to a point. Um, a point, a point right there. Well, is there a way of of doing this for the zero bound below. How does a triangle get a z measure of zero? Uh, well, again, a triangle is not going to do that, but the limit of a triangle can. So again, consider the disk model right here. And if we have our triangle, like we did before, uh, ABC, something like this, A, B, and C, well, we can distort the triangle by actually sending the vertex C far away, send it away from A and B. What would kind of happen in that situation? Well, because of the finite area of hyperbolic geometry, we would end up with a picture kind of like the following. B, we, so we left A and B fixed, but then we allow C to go off towards infinity, like so. And so this right here, um, is, isn't exactly a triangle anymore. It's not a triangle because there aren't three vertices. Notice with the hyperbolic model here, these points uh, on the boundary circle right here are not part of the geometry. These are points at infinity. So if we think of this as uh, a geometry that lives inside of Euclidean geometry, although the, the measure and such is completely different here, uh, we can see this 
point at infinity as a Euclidean point, but it, notice it's not a hyperbolic point. This right here is what's commonly referred to as an asymptotic triangle. Uh, and in many ways, it behaves still like a hyperbolic triangle. Uh, I'm not gonna, I won't can sort of verify that right here, but things like the exterior angle theorem, um, the sicarius legendre theorem still apply in this situation. So we haven't, um, so the angle sum is still less than 180 degrees and things like that. And uh, some really interesting things can happen for these asymptotic triangles. But this is starting to get closer. We, can get, we, we still haven't quite hit the zero degree measure yet. But uh, as you send a point to infinity, some really funky things can start happening that it kind of still behaves like a triangle. But uh, there's still, again, some funky things that are going on with this thing. You'll have an opportunity to explore the, these ideas of an asymptotic hyperbolic triangle very soon. Uh, but we can also kind of repeat this process for what happens if we send A and B towards infinity here. Uh, let me clean this up real quick. If you allow both A and B to go to infinity as well, C stays at infinity, uh, you'll get a picture that looks something like the following maybe. Where you now have three points at infinity, all the vertices of this uh, of this so-called triangle or at infinity now. We might call this an infinite triangle or uh, we'll call it an ideal triangle. It's not really a triangle because there are no vertices. All of these vertices are at infinity, right? But in terms of the measure, one can make sense of the measure. And when your vertice goes towards infinity, the measure became zero. That was true for that asymptotic triangle before. Um, although an asymptotic triangle could still be uh, it could still have an angle sum that's positive because angles A and angle B could be positive angles. But for this ideal triangle, you can actually get that all three angles go to zero. Um, and so this would be sort of, this would be the limit um, of the bounds of what a hyperbolic angle sum could be. So this bottom side here, you get this ideal triangle. And this notice this picture represents sort of the largest possible area that the hyperbolic triangle could get. It's not actually a triangle, but you, your, your area of a hyperbolic triangle is bounded. Um, and so this ideal triangle is what happens as we allow this thing to go towards infinity. All right, well, what about that? That takes care of hyperbolic geometry. What kind of happens in elliptic geometry? Can the same things happen here? Um, and so let us clean up this picture one more time. And so think of what happens as we push these, push to the limits, so to speak, in elliptic geometry as well. So we have elliptic geometry here. And for the sake of drawing, we'll think of this as the spherical model. Although analogous things could happen in the projective model of hyperbolic geometry. So imagine we have a triangle. And for ease of drawing, we'll make it into a double right triangle. Anyways, fun things happen, of course, in that situation. So we have our triangle A, we have our vertices A, B, and C. We'll say C is the North Pole, and it's a double right. So what would happen if we allow C to converge towards the, the, the segment down below? Well, you can imagine kind of what would happen is you're just going to end up with this line segment with C sitting between them. Um, a and B, like so. Um, and again, kind of like we saw before, uh, the limit, the a, if we look at the limit of angle sums, that will converge towards 180 degrees. And so that's much like we saw with the hyperbolic setting as well. If you take the sum of this elliptic triangle, ABC, we know that it sits between 360 degrees and 180 degrees. And much like the hyperbolic setting, uh, this, this 180 degree measure will be obtained when this thing approaches a segment. Oh, of course, you can also squish it down to a point if you want to. Um, and so this is going to represent a small, a small elliptic triangle will have a angle sum close to 180 degrees because its excess will be super small in that situation as well. That's very similar to hyperbolic geometry. The smaller you get, the closer you are to a, elliptic, or to a Euclidean triangle. But what about the other limit, 360? Well, we can see by by using the excess function, this is going to happen when you have a large, have a large triangle. But what does a large triangle mean in hyperbolic or in elliptic geometry right here? Um, so because of the polar distance idea, 
that exist inside of elliptic geometry. In some essence, we can't really shove C any farther away than it already is with this double right triangle right here. Um, so what we kind of want to see next is what happens if we allow um, B kind of we'll keep we'll keep C C fixed and A fixed for this discussion. But if we allow um, C a B to kind of move to the right, um, and you can move it. So you get something like a picture going on over here, over here, over here. And eventually, eventually you're going to reach the opposite side of the sphere and you get basically angle C right now. It's like, who knows, maybe uh, 60 degrees or something like that. But as we move B around, that'll allow C to get bigger, 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 bigger until eventually it reaches 180 degrees. In which case, if I try to sketch that picture, well, we'll just think of it this way. Uh, we'll, we'll change our orientation a little bit. But if we have our sphere again, what can eventually happen as you stretch out angle C bigger, 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 is you can get something that looks like the following. You're going to get these two points, which are uh, they're antipodes of the sphere. We'll call them P and uh, negative P right here. And so we could take two lines uh, that go through P and, and negative P, right? Because we're in spherical or elliptic geometry, it turns out, well, in spherical geometry, two antipodes, uh, there's actually not a single line that connects them. There's infinitely many lines. Think about the globe. We have all these different uh, longitudinal lines that connect the North and South Pole. If you take any two of those and think of the region that is colored between this, right? This is what's commonly referred to as a loon, or sometimes it's called a biangle, because uh, there's only two angles that determine this thing right here. And so a loon is essentially a two-sided polygon that, that exists in elliptic geometry. And this thing is well-designed, well-crafted, right? It, this is a legitimate uh, polygon, right? It's made by uh, straight lines, although those the straight lines are elliptic in this case, but it's two two straight lines and two distinct points form the vertices of these things. Um, this idea of a loon also makes sense in the projective model of elliptic geometry, although in that situation you wouldn't necessarily call it a biangle because there's only one vertex because the P and P uh, negative P get identified together. That's why I'm drawing this as an elliptic. Uh, as a spherical model, it's a little bit easier to see. And it also kind of explains why we call this a, a loon here, because if you think of the phases of the moon, um, these loons represent sort of different phases you could see on the moon here. Um, and so the angle sum of this loon is going to correspond to be the sum of these two angles right here. Although admittedly, your... Um, your third angle of the triangle actually became a straight line, which is 180 degrees. So the angle sum of this loon is going to be 180 degrees plus the measure of angle P and the measure of angle P, negative P here. But as these angles are vertical angles to each other, try to convince yourself of that, you're going to get that the measure of angle P is always equal to the measure of angle negative P. And so the the angle sum of a loon is going to be 180 degrees plus two times the measure of angle P. And so if you allow, we'll draw, try to draw one more picture of this. If you allow the angle P to go off towards um, a right angle, so basically you take off a whole octant of our sphere right here. If you allow a right angle right here, then this would be something that actually obtains a angle sum of exactly at 360 degrees because the idea is when the right when you go past the right angle uh, you're making bigger loons but you're also making smaller loons I mean so you can actually get uh, so a loon is the limit of a triangle of an elliptic triangle I actually can hit this 360 measure but be aware that the loon itself um, actually its angle sums will sit between 540 and uh, 180 you can get loons that are pretty small, uh, but you can get some loons that are pretty big. They can go all the way up to 540 degrees right there as well. And so that kind of just ends this quick little discussion about limits of triangles in um, hyperbolic and elliptic geometry. When you crush the triangle down, it becomes a segment or a point. That kind of that kind of is clear. That's that's fairly simple for all of these geometries. That'd be true for Euclidean geometry as well. But 
um, as we start stretching these triangles out, out, out to their limits, so to speak. I just want to sort of show you this idea that in hyperbolic geometry, you can create these asymptotic and ideal triangles. In elliptic geometry, you can create these loons, uh, which in some ways still behave like triangles because they're limits of triangles, but in many ways, they break the rules and give you something that's a little bit different. All right, everyone. Um, that actually, I think, concludes our series. Um, I suppose there's always the possibility in the future I could add more lectures to this series if time allows for it, but for our standard semester at Southern Utah University, uh, this would be our final lecture. Um, it was great having everyone uh, participate in this lecture series. Um, if you do like what you've seen here, as always, please, please, please like these videos, um, share them with friends who might be interested, subscribe, uh, post any questions you have below in this video or any videos you see here, and uh, let me know. And if there's any extra content you want to see in the future, let me know, and I can try to create those videos for you. Have a great, have a great um, future, everyone. I will hopefully see you in another lecture series sometimes. Um, bye.